My name is Orunduti Parmar. I'm the editor-in-chief of Med City News. We have a very interesting panel um, wa waiting uh, to have a great conversation, but I wanted to begin with a little bit of information about Med City News for those who may not know enough about us. So Med City News was founded in late 2008 to cover innovation in healthcare. I've been an editor since 2016. We are a national publication drawing nearly 2 million page views and 500,000 unique page views per month. We cover biopharma, digital health, medical devices, diagnostics, as well as hospitals and payers in the context of the industry's overall transformation. We also host conferences focusing on investment, population health, precision medicine, digital health, and patient engagement. We accept outside content through our MedCity Influencers Program. So any of you out there who's interested in writing for us, please do email me. Uh, Laura, who's helping us with this conference, will put my email in the chat in case any of you wants to uh, connect with me and write for us. We also have another program called Med Citizens. That's a membership-based program for startups with uh, editorial and event benefits. And then we have our podcast, which we launched earlier this year called the Med City Pivot Podcast. You can listen to all our episodes. Um, they have everything from pharmaceutical uh, and vaccine development to policy. We had a very interesting interview with Zeke Emanuel a few months ago. And again, if you have any suggestions for me to uh, invite a certain guest, please do contact me at the email address, aparmar at medcnews.com. We have wanted to thank Merck uh, for being a sponsor without whom this event would not be possible. We had a very interesting conversation with uh, a gentleman leading social determinants uh, at Merck and uh, hopefully that video will be made available soon on our site. Uh, and a big thank you to our partner, uh, New Orleans Business Alliance. I wanted to now turn it over to Quentin Messer Jr., President and CEO of the uh, NOLA BA. And uh, Quentin, please take it away. Thank you so much, Arundhati, and, and the entire team at Med City News. We're very grateful. Look, I just want to say a, a, really three things. One, thank you for everyone for taking time out of your busy schedule to really have this, engage in this important um, conversation um, about social determinants of health and population health. Um, that's one. Two, uh, the New Orleans Business Alliance is the accredited economic development organization um, for uh, the city of New Orleans. And we are so grateful for this opportunity to let people know that really New Orleans is an underrated hub for digital health and other bioinnovation companies. And we encourage folks to take advantage. Let me move my head. And there you can see, if you go to nolaba.org, uh, there's information about incentives and other programs for startup companies, uh, bioinnovation, digital health, or one of the um, sectors for which we are very excited. And the final thing before I um, uh, turn it back over to the Med City team is we're really grateful uh, for the conversation. And really, I, I want to say a special, take a moment of privilege, a special shout out to the moderator, Dr. Jennifer Avegno. Uh, in addition to being a tremendous uh, emergency room physician, she's also the director of public health in New Orleans. And she has one of the most um, challenging um, uh, public health roles in America because this tragedy with COVID-19 attacks socialization. And no other city knows how to socialize or is built on socialization the way New Orleans is. So we're very grateful to Jennifer and her team's leadership. And I'm so glad that she and other distinguished members uh, of the bioinnovation and medical community will be having this fireside chat. So thank you again. Um, and please, we are grateful to Business Alliance to be really elevating uh, bioinnovation and digital health. And the, and the last thing I'll be remiss if I didn't shout out my colleagues, Jeanette Weiland, Chandra Tattleton, and Valerie Huntley for their work in putting together this event. Thank you very kindly. Quentin, thank you so much for that. You know, we've enjoyed our partnership and I hope that continues um, for a long time. Um, with that, I wanted to share my screen again and bring forth the panel. 
So we are uh, talking about how to reimagine population at a time of great global and national peril. Our moderator is Dr. Jennifer Avegno. She is the New Orleans, uh, she works at the New Orleans Department of Health. Uh, Taylor Justice uh, is with Unite Us, a company on the forefront of redefining social determinants of health. Dr. Phil Orovitz is with Oshner Health System, and he looks at population health strategies. Dr. Stephen Peskin is with Blue, Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, I'm sorry, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. He also is a population health expert. And then Scott Tornick is with Penn Medicine Center for Community Workers. And that organization has created a very interesting program and toolkit that other health systems are using to kickstart their um, population health and sort of social, social determinants of health program. So with that, I wanted to turn it over to Dr. Avegno. Dr. Avegno, please take it away. Well, thank you so much, Arantati, and thank you uh, to Quentin and Nola BA, not only for the kind um, introduction, but also for being such fantastic partners here in the city as we try to uh, really support and promote the health of all of our residents and our visitors and make this a, a healthy place to be, um, but also really seeing health in a different way and seeing its interconnectedness to what um, many of us were refer to as social determinants of health, or really as the underpinning for a functioning economy and society. And I think we are seeing the effects of that most acutely in the last nine months with the COVID pandemic. Um, I'd like for each of our esteemed panelists to introduce themselves, if they would, and let our audience know just a little bit about their background. We're we're really fortunate. I'm very excited to have such a diverse range of talents and perspectives um, from nonprofit to, you know, pretty entrenched healthcare institutions, both locally and nationally. So it's going to make for a good discussion, I'm sure. And please, everyone, feel free to um, put your questions in the chat and, and we will address them. Um, let's go ahead maybe and start uh, Start with our hometown gentleman uh, with Phil from uh, from Ochsner. Hey, uh, thank you, Jennifer, and good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from New Orleans, um, where we've been through two spikes of the uh, of the COVID uh, pandemic, and uh, hopefully aren't seeing the third uh, starting to appear before our eyes. I'm the chief of population health at Ochsner, and really drive a lot of the um, drive a lot of the strategy. Um, and programmatic elements of population health at Auctioner. And it's really far reaching from case management activities to, uh, to uh, patient outreach, um, to our digital programs. Um, and, and COVID, I would just say, you know, we'll get into it uh, after we hear from the others. COVID has really unleashed um, a wave of innovation um, at Auctioner. Um, I would describe, you know, in the area of telehealth, we moved forward by three years in the matter of three weeks. So we'll get into this in some of the dialogue as we hear from the others. Um, but I would say, um, um, you know, COVID has been, uh, you know, ha has been a catalyst um, that uh, will change the face of healthcare at Auctioner um, pretty much forever, I would say. So that, that's just maybe some introductory comments. Great, thanks, Phil. Um, let's let's go next to Stephen. Good afternoon. Greetings from the parking lot of an FQHC. I'm actually going in to see patients in a bit. I'm a general internist, uh, executive medical director of Population Health and Transformation. So I work with our clinical partners, whether she be a solo family physician or a large health system like Robert Wood Johnson, Barnabas, or Hackensack Meridian. And we really work around the quadruple aim, better care, affordability, patient experience, and healthcare professional sustainability. Uh, COVID has also had a profound impact in New Jersey. As everyone knows, we were at the dark days of the first wave of the pandemic and things are getting really bad again. I understand the Hackensack University Medical Center has converted the cafeteria once again into a makeshift ICU. Uh, and we really work around five areas, uh, payment, innovation, payment redesign, care coordination, and collaboration with our clinical partners, data and analytics, having recently set up 
uh, our own virtual uh, or our, I'm sorry, uh, uh, health information exchange learning collaborative, which we work with CPC classic and now CPC plus and our own efforts and really, and then member patient education and information um, so that people understand that their medical home is not a nursing home or the horizon mobile van, but it's a place to get comprehensive person centered uh, high value care. And we also do a lot of work in uh, episodes of care as well, bundle payment models uh, that, that kind of encompass our population health management efforts. Uh, is, even though we're a rather modest single state blue plan at 3.8 million persons, including about 800,000 Medicaid persons, uh, I think we have one of the largest episode programs in the country. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Um, I also personally know the the uh, dichotomy of being the clinician and the, the having to put on your population health hat. So I've taken many calls in my car as well. Um, let's move next to uh, our, our non-clinical or, or less, you know, different partners. Um, Taylor from Unitas, tell us about yourself. Hi everyone, this is Taylor Justice. I am the president and co-founder here at Unite Us. We are based in New York City, um, but we developed um, a platform that uh, allows health, human, social service organizations uh, to coordinate care around shared clients. So when you think of a clinical care coordination network, extend that out into the community with human and social service agencies or CBOs that provide food, transportation, housing, legal, um, uh, you know, those typical human and social service um, uh, service categories. And we create an ecosystem where we can drive towards outcomes. You know, we, we wanted to move away from this concept of having the most up-to-date phone book or resource directory and actually have the true north of Unite Us being, can I prove that the patient, the member, the client, the individual in need actually receive the services that they're looking for? Uh, and so uh, we started in 2013, um, have now expanded to 42 states across the country. Most people know us for being the statewide infrastructure in North Carolina or the enterprise-wide solution for Kaiser Permanente. Uh, and during the pandemic, I think one of the second and third order effects of the clinical response has been the unprecedented stress uh, that the human and social service systems have felt uh, and in the past eight months have been selected to expand statewide infrastructure in 15 states uh, to really address those needs. Uh, we have people that are accessing, you know, maybe public benefits for the very first time uh, or just need assistance with food, uh, housing, utilities, uh, etc. And um, we've uh, deployed our technology and our team uh, and had to move kind of a virtual environment, but I've still seen success on getting community-based organizations to adopt the tool and ensure that we're resolving outcomes. Thanks, Taylor. Great to hear your perspective. And then let's finish up with Scott. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Tornick. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the Penn Medicine Center for Community Health Workers. Um, I do not have a healthcare background. I started uh, working at Penn uh, about five years ago. I have a background in, in building businesses, uh, startups um, with investors and, and so forth, and uh, was really intrigued by Dr. Kangobi's work in population health. So um, we are a, a center that has kind of three areas of operation uh, for our community health worker uh, impact model, which we developed at Penn. We have Ongoing research, we're one of the few community health worker models in the country that has science behind it. So we have now three randomized control trials uh, showing very strong results across the triple aim, not just in improvements in utilization, but chronic disease measures, quality, uh, you know, a, a whole host of different uh, outcomes that, that we track. Uh, we also use that as the foundation for a business case at Penn Medicine uh, and quickly scaled up to a full-fledged center of close to 60 full-time employees, uh, over half of whom are working with patients, uh, community health workers, their managers, a director of the program, coordinators on the data side. And uh, before COVID, we were working with about 2,000 uh, high-risk uh, you know, patients per year in a, about an eight zip code area. And with COVID, we quickly had a pivot to working um, 
you know, remotely. And so we, we within a few weeks, we were up and running remotely. Uh, all of our community health workers have laptops, cell phones, um, and we uh, were able to, to, to service about pretty quickly twice that caseload. Uh, so we're about 4,000 plus patients a year in a wider geographic catchment area. Um, and then the area that I started up um, when I came on board was really to take all that great work at Penn and help organizations around the country do the same thing. So we uh, are now in about 20 states working actively with about 50 uh, different healthcare organizations that range from uh, large health systems uh, to CBOs to um, organizations uh, like Dr. Peskin's uh, in conjunction with, um, you know, a number of, of hospital systems in the, in the state of New Jersey. Um, we work with health departments at a state and local level to plan and implement sustainable, scalable, evidence-based community health worker programs using uh, impact, but tailored to their local environment. So excited to be here and, and look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Um, let's jump right in. Uh, the, the way we've got this organized, and again, we're, we're welcome anybody um, to submit a question if something piques your interest. Um, we're going to start with Phil and Stephen. Uh, both of them referenced technology in some form and how that's really transformed their ability to provide care during COVID and then sort of what that means for the future. So, Phil and Stephen, and, and you guys can decide who goes first. How are your organizations best using technology? And, and that really can mean anything, telehealth, AI, um, whatever it means to you to keep your pa patients connected throughout the pandemic. And how do you see that, uh, that changing? What are the lasting changes uh, that you think might result from this really seismic shift in the way traditional clinical care has been um, distributed? Yeah, so, so maybe I can jump in there to start. And I apologize, I'm dodging uh, yard guys today and leaf blowers. So we'll, you'll see me moving around a little bit. Um, but when I talked earlier about this being a transformative event, um, auctioner has been doing uh, telehealth for many, many years. Um, and mostly it was limited though to hospital to hospital connections, right? Telehealth, telepsychiatry, um, we have a telestork program. So very much hospital to hospital um, communications. And, uh, and with our EMR platform, we were just on the, on the cusp of, of launching um, you know, direct, to, uh, direct to patient uh, telehealth services and, and actually uh, you know, bringing it into the ambulatory space. And I would describe, um, you know, as I described earlier, um, you know, COVID was the perfect catalyst that we needed. And, and we see it in our numbers. In 2019, we did 3,000 ambulatory telehealth visits. Uh, today in 20, 2020, um, we are up over 300,000 for the year. So literally, right, once COVID hit, like you saw in, in most of the country, we, um, you know, essentially we went 100% virtual. And so really didn't miss a beat. Um, you know, patients quickly adapted, our providers quickly adapted, right? And what we saw was that typical adoption curve, as I talked about, literally was compressed to the matter of days and weeks. Um, the providers really um, got on board very quickly. And, um, you know, as I say, we went up to 100% virtual. Um, you know, as, we've, <clears throat> as we got through the first spike um, and patients started feel, feeling more comfortable coming back into the office, um, you know, we've, we've also, we've dipped down again. And so I'd say we're probably sitting at about 15 to 20% of all our visits are virtual. We think the pendulum is going to swing back. Um, as I talk to different groups around the country, what we're kind of projecting out, the more, the more value-based uh, care that your system's providing, the more you're going to adopt telehealth. And, you know, I, we try to project, you know, where do we think this ultimately is going to end up? Uh, I suspect it's going to be in the 40 to 50 percent range of all visits. In fact, you know, there's probably not a specialty that per, couldn't provide care, um, you know, in, in, in a telehealth platform. And of course, it's specialty specific too, right? One of the areas we know that's going to pretty much has converted to telehealth is behavioral health. 
right? That they can they can um, use telehealth. So um, you know, so again, we saw this huge uptake, um, and I think it's going to swing back. <clears throat> it's going to swing back as we learn more. I think the second area. Um, that we've really accelerated is we've been in the digital space and I kind of use the term digital for remote monitoring um, in terms of blood pressure, diabetes, um, you know, using, um, you know, connected devices uh, that can get those uh, blood pressure readings and, and, and blood sugar readings right into our electronic health record. And uh, during COVID, we've doubled this year. So I were up over 15,000 patients on these platforms. And I know one of the challenges has been, you know, how do you provide chronic disease care for patients during COVID? For the patients on these programs, they didn't miss a beat, right? Their blood pressures kept coming in. We were able to adjust their meds and monitor them. So I'd say those are probably two of the biggest areas um, where, um, where, you know, where technology really assisted during COVID. Yeah, that's um, fascinating. I have, I got my own questions, but maybe Stephen, if you want to jump yeah, in and see I mean, how your experience uh, jives. We've, yeah, we've invested a tremendous amount in our, as I mentioned, our health information exchange with the company called Orion and also using Salesforce Health Cloud. And that's really to provide our clinical partners with information at the point of care. So you may be in one medical group or health system like an Oshner but people may be getting care at LSU or something, or uh, in New Jersey, you may be uh, part of some medical group, but, but someone is seen in Atlantic Health System. So that ability to provide that kind of information real time has been one of our areas of focus. Uh, we're also using, have been moving toward um, MPI level information. So at the individual physician level versus the 10 tax identification number, telehealth has certainly been a really big deal. We stood up a program, actually I was working seven days a week for, for uh, about eight weeks to create a program uh, with another entrepreneurial company out of New York called Pager so that we could uh, improve our virtual care access for our 3.8 million members and a lot of other kinds of um, interventions in technology or, or cohesion, whether the partner is using Lumeris or whether they're using Lightbeam. Um, there are lots and lots of brands out there. I'm not endorsing any of them, but uh, our ability as a payer to really be able to kind of sync up with different platforms is, is part of what we see as our, as our mission in, in New Jersey as our as our clinical partners uh, widen and deepen their efforts in, in population health management and, and data science and analytics. And speaking of data science and analytics, when you talk about health information technology, that kind of comes hand in glove, right? So using um, a lot of different kinds of um, analytic tools to uh, advance and, and improve the, what the, the information that the clinician has, or really the care team. It's not just the MD or DO, it's the, the care coordinators. Uh, I was on a call with our medical directors, myself and one of my colleagues talking about uh, the, the, it's definitely, a, primary care is definitely a team sport. So medical assistants, office managers, um, the, the folks that are, 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 again, working with the patients on, um, on behaviors. Uh, again, the, the great work that we've been doing with Penn around addressing social determinants of health is, is also an important part of that. And, and technology uh, kind of informs all of that. Yeah, that, that's going to be a great segue um, for the next part of the conversation with Taylor and Scott, uh, that sort of connecting the technology to the person. But bef before we, we go there, I, I just wanted to get each of your perspectives um, about, you know, about what are some key factors that you think happened because of COVID or, you know, that, that led this become, it to become a crisis opportunity. Um, so in terms of FQHCs and hospitals, uh, what, were, what were key parts of the quick widespread adoption of telehealth? Was it, um, you know, payment models changing? Was it loosening of restrictions? You know, because we're not always gonna have a COVID 
and very traditional institutions like healthcare systems, like FQHCs, have to be nimble and look for those opportunities and take advantage of what's being presented. So maybe Stephen, what do you think it was? Yeah, I think, I think it was, yeah, I think it was loosening of restrictions and mm -hmm. one word, survival. So yeah. um, there were, I, I was surprised a friend of mine, Dr. Baruch, an orthopedic surgeon embraced telehealth. And I said, how the heck is orthopedic surgery where the physical exam is so vital and, and advanced imaging is so important. So, um, so telehealth really became a, an issue of survival for, for, for uh, uh, clinical organizations. And so that, you know, so whether it's DOCS-CME, whether it's Doximity, whether it's UpDocs, whether it's Epic, whether it's a thousand other, and I, again, I don't uh, mean to leave anybody out, um, follow, my, follow my care. So there are lots of different platforms at work or even FaceTime um, in, the, in, the, in the relaxed standards of the pandemic and even Zoom as we're on today. So, uh, so it, was, it was survival and it was relaxing standards in my view as well it drove, the, drove the, um, uh, the rapid adoption of telehealth. Yeah, I would say the CMS, I mean, we've been lobbying CMS for years to cover these services. And certainly it took the pandemic for them to issue the waivers, right? So we've took advantage, you know, amongst all the waivers that, um, you know, that we've took advantage of and are still taking advantage of during the pandemic. The one that I think is going to have lasting benefit is telehealth, right? When all the other waivers go away, telehealth will still be here. And I think, you know, we all believe that, 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 to me is really the lasting, um, you know, one of the lasting effects of, um, you know, of, of, of COVID, right? Um, and that's why I think it's just so critical um, that, you know, our systems were ready, geared up and ready to go. Many of us had the technologies in place. Um, what we didn't have were payment waivers and relaxation of regulation. Yeah, I'll just add to that, you know, I'm an emergency physician by training and, and still do some clinical work. And, you know, before COVID, you, you couldn't have convinced me that telehealth was um, anything that an emergency physician could or should do. But, you know, Stephen, like you said, part of it was survival and Phil, you know, having an infrastructure that allowed the system to completely pivot everybody to telehealth and then having that experience and being able to connect with patients in that way gave me a great deal of confidence. And now it's something that, you know, I can see us incorporating, you know, in some fashion, even in one of the specialties that I don't think any of us would have predicted uh, it would make sense in. Um, so I, I completely agree with that. And that's how I'll segue to uh, Taylor and Scott. So, you know, with what you both do, it really is about that all of the services that go into, you know, creating health. We know that the social determinants of health are anywhere from 50 to 80% of someone's ultimate medical outcomes. That's far more, although those of us who are physicians would like to take credit for the rest of it, we know it's not really us. So what, what you all and your organizations do is really provide that, that person-centered human touch. How, how do you engage with the community right now where everything has, has gone digital or many things have and, and a lot of that's not coming back? How do you make sure that, that people's needs are still being met, that you're hearing your patients and, and serving patients in the same way or different ways than you were before? Um, Taylor, you wanna start? Yeah, um, I think the way that we look at, at the market and I think the way most people should look at the human and social service landscape is it's not as traditionally as sophisticated as healthcare. And so there aren't those appropriate supply chains that are in place. And we learned that the hard way. When we started back in 2013, we were initially just focused on the veteran and military population. So my co-founder and I felt like if we had you know, the, uh, these resources, put them on a pretty map, veterans and their families could find these resources and connect to them. The beauty of the veteran and military community is they don't let you blow smoke. And so what we realized is that we were sending them to a black hole. There was no accountability on the back end. Organizations didn't even know that they were part of a list. And so what we realized is if we wanted to have a really strong consumer facing tool, there needed to be a better supply chain. So once you plug that person into a network, it was going to be something that worked. Did they show up to the organization? 
was that organization able to facilitate that care? If not, what are the reasons why? So the, the, what we realize is you have to build the infrastructure, you have to build relationships with community-based organizations. And when you have those community-based organizations that can sign up for service level agreement, meet agreements, meaning I'm gonna to respond to a referral in a certain time hack, I'm gonna keep my own information up to date so we're not spending human capital kind of updating a, a phone book every six to 12 months. Um, and more importantly, they're gonna give us the outcome data on the services that have been rendered. And so when you run into a situation like a pandemic where you aren't able to build those relationships in person with a community, you still have to have that change management process because just like I can't walk to a big health system and say, hey, we're our social determinants of health vendor, you need to use us as the secondary tool, they'll never agree to it. It needs to be included into their workflow. It needs to be a part of uh, their process so that you know there isn't this secondary system. You have to do the same thing with community-based organizations. And so a big focus of ours when we're working with healthcare is they need to treat human and social service agencies at the same priority level as healthcare and understand that they're under similar constraints. Usually they're understaffed, underfunded and overworked, especially during a pandemic. And so to better serve the patient or the end beneficiary of services, you need to have a very optimized network that once you plug them into it, it's gonna work for them and also deliver results. And then when you identify this as a service that is either at capacity or doesn't exist or eligibility requirements are too stringent, you bring that community together to see what you can do. Is it a philanthropic investment to address a particular capacity need? Is it a policy shift where you need local or state government? Are there some other factors that come into play as we start to optimize this workflow? Human and social services and the infrastructure that they use uh, oftentimes are pen and paper Excel sheets or the dreaded wall full of brochures where they hand somebody an, uh, some information on a resource and send them on their way. And so we have an opportunity, though, during the crisis and during the pandemic to leapfrog and bring human and social services into the 21st century, where they're at that same priority level. They have the ability to connect with these uh, healthcare organizations and that now they're collaborating and working together to address needs holistically. Yeah, that what I'm hearing you say, I think, is that, you know, although the end result of all of that work might be to touch the patient directly in some way, so much of the work can be virtual because it's about building relationships and having infrastructure that's in place, regardless of whether you're talking on the phone, doing it over Zoom or, or meeting in person, you're still gonna get the same result for that person who, who really needs it. Um, Scott, what about you? How do, how do community health workers um, and, and those that you work with, how, how do they do remote work during a pandemic? How do they use technology? Uh, sure. So it's interesting. Uh, Pre-COVID, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I mean, our, our work is, is a foot in the clinic, a foot in the community. Um, so we have um, something called Homebase that uh, is an app that we developed at Penn uh, and some of our partner organizations use. Uh, that provides real-time feeds uh, from the EMR to our community health workers who are on call each day to receive new patients. So uh, in, in the, I guess, physical world, what we were doing is uh, the CHWs would actually go to the clinic or the hospital floor and hospital room where the patients who are eligible for the program uh, were located and, you know, introduce themselves and you know, most of the time get to work right away on patient-centered goal setting, uh, understanding their life story. And because of the type of folks who we identify and hire to be community health workers who are naturally empathetic, good listeners, um, who we, you know, train with specific, you know, skills and tools to leverage that, you know, they're, they're creating a bond and, and, and a sense of credibility because they're from the same neighborhoods, as I'm sure you've heard. Uh, and they can get to work on solving those uh, challenges, a lot of which take place in the community. So home visits, uh, you know, working with them on connecting on, uh, you know, just following up on goals uh, that in, involve doing things now. In, in COVID, uh, the, one of the challenges was just connecting with those patients. So um, phone calls from a number that uh, someone's never heard or recognized is, is going to result in a low uptake rate. So what we did was we ended up using batch texting to increase our uptake rates and that worked very well because once the community health worker was able to connect with potential uh, patients to work with them uh, because of the types of folks who we hire that part was easy so that part went very well the, the reality is i think 
what, what, what the innovation that we're starting to see is that not everyone needs the same level of intervention. Uh, there's, there's a spectrum of what patients need depending on those, their social determinants and their challenges. So some need you know, the, the, the full enchilada, some could benefit just from more of the telehealth type of intervention. So uh, we're doing the best we can. We're getting really good results still despite uh, having folks in the community, but uh, definitely plan on having uh, you know, a, a mix once, once COVID is more under control. Yeah, the, the, the uh, not wanting to pick up the phone for a random number is, is real. It's what our contact tracers are, are fighting against. Um, but, you know, I, I'm sure your, your CHWs know exactly the right method to reach folks in their community. And, and we're able to tell you pretty quickly, no, that's not going to work. We've got to text. We've got to do this. Um, and, and really, it's, it's their area of expertise that helps you drive the appropriate technology. Um, I'm going to uh, sort of shift for a second. We've got some questions in the chat, and so I'd, I'd like to open, try to get, get them in so everybody can be heard. So um, one uh, questioner asks, how are your teams working with people with chronic conditions like diabetes? What tools and technologies do they have uh, to help them and their pa patients improve their health? I think this is a great question because it gets at a chronic disease that all of us deal with in different ways. And so um, let's just hear real briefly from each of you how your team, your organization, your institution would um, use either high-tech or low-tech methods to help somebody with, um, with diabetes. Uh, why don't we start again with Phil? Go from the top. Yes, so I think it's it's not one or the other, it's one and the other. So, you know, as I described, you know, we'll use telehealth visits, we'll use our digital platforms to monitor. But then um, I would tell you one of the, one of the big uh, secrets to our success is using our diabetes educators um, to really help to monitor the patients. And this is where we really broaden our, scro our scope of what, um, where, how we're able to intervene with patients because they're, they're screening patients with social determinants. Uh, they're screening them with a diabetes distress scale. So we really get down to really understanding, um, you know, what diabetes means for the person. Um, you know, it's not just an A1C level, which, you know, sometimes we clinicians just want to get the person under control, but it's really the, I get the, you know, our teams get, to the root causes of, um, you know, why patients can't get to goal. And, and, and in many cases, right, we're then able to come up with interventions, non-medical interventions, by the way, um, that will help the patients. And, you know, I hear from many of our primary care physicians who, you know, sends a patient off into our program and six months later, they come back, uh, you know, and, and are tuned up and in really good shape. So it's not one or the other, but I would say, I think we're really tapping into social determinants and, and non-clinical uh, non uh, interventions to improve the situation. Stephen, what about from the FQHC side or from the payer side? Yeah, so we're, um, a lot of the work in chronic condition management is, is you know, led by our, our, our clinical teams, clinical organizations, and the the, the tools that we've provided, um, data insights can help. And then a lot of the things that we've done in the, the, the shared learning through CPC Classic and now CPC Plus, and then again, Horizons efforts and patient center medical home, ACO arrangements. Um, Horizon also provides some additional support in say a, a chronic condition like diabetes and Social determinants were mentioned. So we have our neighbors and health program that my friend from 10 knows about that, that really um, uses community health workers to improve health literacy, to address things like transportation and, and diet and nutrition. So it's, it's been a, um, and, and then we, you know, we've worked with a few of the DPP diabetes prevention programs as well, but largely it's around how we collaborate with our clinical partners. Again, I want to emphasize it could be a solo family physician like my friend Millie Franz or a large, one of the largest multi-specialty groups in the country like Summit. And, and we, um, we work with all 
all of our care partners and, and it takes on different shapes and forms and we have to be flexible when we're working with a hospital system versus uh, independent practice. But it really, uh, again, focuses on addressing gaps in care. Um, again, I'm in clinic this afternoon and I remember a patient, uh, a resident who said, oh, Dr. Peskin, the blood pressure is 112 over 78. The A1C is 7.1, everything's fine. And I go in and I see a person who's got a stump, a cane, and I said, this person is far from fine. And he, the healthcare system has largely failed him. And the best we can do is get him social services because he's blind and um, he's um, got a, a below the knee amputation. And he's got also, by the way, he's got CKD4. So um, that would not exactly be, even though the gaps in care look good, um, that would not exactly be a uh, good result. Yeah, it's interesting that that both of y'all who you know have such innovations and and such strong use of AI and and digital in your institutions, you know, are, are recognizing that the numbers and the the data don't always tell the story. It's it's looking at Absolutely. the patient and seeing the whole person. Um, Taylor and Scott, what what about y'all? How do you how would you address you know a chronic diabetic in your systems? Yeah, so from our perspective, again, we're looking to build infrastructure and create those appropriate supply chains. Um, so it depends on are we dealing with a diabetic or a pre-diabetic? Um, what type of intervention programs are available? Uh, is it a part of a DPP program where there's uh, some sort of payment associated to the organization that's facilitating that care? Is it a covered benefit where they're actually going to pay for you know, a medically tailored meal or some other type of intervention? Or do we need to then pull in those public benefits, SNAP, WIC type of services to kind of have these wraparound uh, um, um, aspects? I mean, I think it's one of the top needs that we... Um, uh, we encounter just based on the, the large population, you know, 34 plus million people that have type two diabetes. I think it's 80 million plus folks that have, or that have pre-diabetes, but how do you uh, efficiently create that supply chain to include those service categories? So what we're doing is then creating the pipes, you know, so that individuals like social care workers, social workers, or excuse me, uh, community health workers, social workers, uh, care managers, or these DPP programs can say, okay, if I need someone that, to, to have access to a medically tailored meal, where do I go and how do I facilitate that referral so that I can ensure that the patient got it? Same thing to SNAP, same thing to nutrition education. Uh, what if I need to have a ride enabled referral because the person doesn't actually have access to either get to the, the education class or to receive the food? Again, thinking about all of those logistical pieces so that that social worker, that community health worker can operate at the top of their license and they're not being a kind of a local travel agent, if you will. We're kind of building that that infrastructure in place and saying, okay, here are the, the best fit solutions that meet this person's eligibility requirements that are within a reasonable geographic uh, uh, range so that we don't create a logistical problem. And we're connecting those dots. And then I think one of the things that we have to do from a social care perspective is make healthcare care about social care uh, and like look at the ROI associated to that. And when you look at studies and you bring those evidence-based solutions, we know that there are cost savings for um, uh, delivering uh, medically tailored meals. We know that there are cost savings uh, associated to um, these education programs down to the individual patient level on an annual basis. And so what we have to do is not only build the supply chain, create those bundles, but then say, okay, here's the ROI analysis of why you should invest in, in care about the, the social care infrastructure. I would phrase it as health is wealth <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen, any thoughts? Oh, sorry, Scott. We did Stephen already. Scott. Yeah, uh, sure. So, I, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that uh, we've seen and, you know, a lot of CHW programs have been in a boom cycle for, you know, since the ACA uh, was passed in 2010. And, you know, yet a lot of them are failing. And one of the reasons they're failing uh, to this day is, is because they're, you know, a lot of these programs are disease specific. They're based on a certain grant for funding uh, and they have to hit certain metrics and they're missing that underlying root cause that, um, you know, community health workers identify so well. So whether it's, you know, diabetes or weight loss or smoking cessation, they're really focusing on that patient story and understanding 
what is the root cause of th these social determinants that they're suffering from and how can they fix them? And then if, if one of the patient-centered goals is A1C, they'll work uh, with their uh, you know, PCP to, to make sure that there's a, a path toward doing that. Um, but you know, how they get there is really up to the CHW. So they have a lot of latitude there um, to, to figure out how, how do we improve a patient's health. But if you don't solve some of these underlying challenges uh, to Dr. Peskin's point earlier, um, you know, diabetes education, for instance, usually isn't going to work. There's usually multiple comorbidities. There's um, issues at the home that um, CHWs have to get to first and, and work on those problems. And then they can connect um, and work with those patients real time, getting things done, not just referring, but uh, actually doing the work with the patient for a set period of time and achieving those goals. Yeah, what all of you are, are saying is, you know, it's a top down and a bottom up approach. And so, you know, the, the technology and the impersonal really needs the personal in order to work. You, you can't really have one without the other. Um, we do have a, a, another question or two, and I, I want to get to those, but I, I really did want to highlight for, for at least a minute We lost your audio. Yeah, we, yeah your audio. Oh gosh, I, you that's because I moved. That's because I didn't unmute. Sorry, you'd think I'd learn. I apologize, everybody. Um, no, what I was saying is that really what you're all describing is both a top-down and a bottom-up approach. That you can't have the technical without the personal if you want it to work. Um, and so, with all the advancements that we've seen, and and the the wave of the future, maybe being telehealth, maybe not. Um, you know, we're never going to lose. That, that those eyes, that personal connection. Um, and that sort of brings me to, you know, one, one of the, the questions that I have for the group, and I know we're running short on time, and I do want to get to one of the other questions in the chat, but maybe if everybody could, you know, focus for a minute on how advances that we've seen in COVID in both the digital and the personal services in terms of health, how can we change or design them to deliberately disrupt the systemic inequities that have produced health disparities for generations. You know, most of us knew this before COVID, but COVID completely shined a very harsh light on the disparities in the American health system. So how are your organizations in light of this or probably hopefully work you've been doing even before that, how are your organizations refocusing their efforts um, and centering on health equity? And, and let's, let's go backwards. Scott, you wanna take that one? Uh, sure. I, you know, one of the things you'll see on our website are open letters um, to Congress and CMS uh, for exactly that reason. I mean, I, one thing that we all know COVID uh, really shone a, a light on was the, you know, how the most vulnerable communities are getting hit the hardest by COVID. And this is something that wasn't surprising to us, uh, but it's just as tragic. Um, so we are advocating uh, at a federal level for you know, broader funding, as, as you know, in most states, uh, community health worker, you know, um, work is not billable for the most part. And if it is billable, it's not covering the costs of the program. Uh, so there's still a pretty big gap and it's, it's covering at most a, a pretty narrow range of services. So broadening those services um, and, you know, just getting more funding in general uh, from CMS to do this great work that we now have science uh, showing that it does work. We just published a paper recently that's showing that for uh, Medicaid beneficiaries, uh, CMS would save, uh, taxpayers would save about $4,200 a year uh, per beneficiary. Um, so that ROI is, is about, you know, up to almost $2.50 per dollar spent on a science-based community health worker program. So we'd like to see uh, more of that activity. As would we, for sure, from a public health perspective. Um, Taylor, what about you? I know a lot of the work of Unitas is really um, focused on reversing or eliminating disparities. Yeah, I mean, health equity um, is is our work. Uh, it's it's localized. It's in the community. It's it always will start with community engagement and. Um, uh, building relationships with the organizations uh, in uh, underserved communities. So, you know, health equity is a collaborative approach. Unite Us takes our role within health equity 
uh, as first and foremost of removing barriers to access for care? Can we create those appropriate supply chains that people can connect to services in the appropriate way? And then leveraging the data and insights so that we can identify those inequities or those disparities. I think when most people think about data and analytics or population health, everyone's probably seen the, the pretty heat maps of communities and this is where the problem areas are. Or here's where a certain population lives. Uh, but the, the real question is, what do you do with that information? Like, what do you do next? And I think when you marry that publicly available data that you might get from LexisNexis and put it into those pretty heat maps, how do you marry that with what's tactically happening on the ground to have a very, very tight shot group of where are those disparities in this county versus this county? And you can't just do broad sweeping solutions over an entire state and hope to address those needs. And so we see our role then is not only just looking at the data, but then a true partnership uh, partnership and strategy on uh, policy development of where can we leverage uh, social determinants of health at the state Medicaid level where social determinants of health infrastructure is included into, into rates where health plans that, you know, will, will, uh, continue to argue that they have razor thin margins that they can operate with. Well, if you put it in under, you know, the quality improvement task, then you have the ability to have this infrastructure where it becomes core to your operation. And then, then we can start to look at, um, um, you know, uh, place-based initiatives and community investment. You know, you, you have to create escalation paths. I talked about earlier the lack of appropriate public health infrastructure, the lack of appropriate funding to community-based uh, uh, community organizations and, and human and social service agencies is significant. And until we start to make some of those shifts and identify if I'm going to make these investments in a community to really uh, uproot these disparities and, and have true health equity, then there's a ton of things that full, uh, full circle have to happen, policy, funding, uh, data, supply, and getting everybody on the same page. And so we see ourselves as a component of that overarching puzzle, um, um, but a, a, a very important uh, uh, component to where we're highlighting the data needs and then creating those escalation paths on actually how to address them. Yeah, I think um, I think you just threw the ball to our, our health plans here, uh, and I think I'm not sure if Stephen Stephen yeah, was masked yeah, up. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm suited up. Uh, <laughs> I like I'm, I'm in the, I'm um, in the doctor mode, but yeah, we're doing. So when, um, yeah, when you hear that, you know, investing for a payer to be investing in social determinants and inequities, you know, how does that strike you? Yeah, so we're we're doing that through our neighbors in health program, and we have certain uh, funding for that. Some of it was related to the. Um, some of the tax changes and what we call trip funding. And then we're also doing quite a bit through our foundation and with certain organizations like African American Chamber of Commerce and my good friend, John Harmon and Mr. Menendez at the Hispanic Chamber. So it's a, it's a multi-pronged effort. And, and again, um, I certainly want to give our clinical partners there to organizations like Rutgers Robert Johnson and Mr. Ostrowski. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a, a very much a collaborative effort, and I think also it's, you know, raising recognition and having our CEO um, speak out about it so that the, the persons who are employees of Horizon, uh, actually some of whom are even also affected by health inequities, are, are made aware and, and, and take action. And Phil, I, I, I want to give you the last word on this because I know your organization just made a significant announcement um, and, and funding commitment to um, health equity. Yeah, I, and I would say I, I think I agree with you know everything that the that the my colleagues have stated here. And you know it starts with um, just something as simple as reporting your quality metrics by race, um, right? To to really make people to raise awareness even in our own system. Uh, but you're right, Auctioner has just announced a $100 million endeavor over the next five years with the goal of um, really improving the health status of other citizens of our state uh, throughout the course of the decade. Um, we're trying to get out of, you know, as you, it's not a surprise that Louisiana is usually 49 or 50 in health, in state health rankings. So we're, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see what we can do over the course of the decade. And that includes opening community health centers, 
Um, it includes um, providing training grants for physicians in training to stay in our state. Um, we've started along with Xavier University here in the city, a new center for health equity. So I, I, I agree with you. This has been around forever and no one's been talking about it. And, and clearly COVID has made this uh, an incredible issue that uh, we now all have to hold hands uh, and, and our, hold hands and solve it. And we know, but we do know health systems aren't the only solution. It's government, it's community, it's health, it's payers. It's really how those four elements come together. And, you know, but we feel like, you know, we can take a leadership role in that and, and our system's ready to go. Thank you all. I know we're a few minutes past time. I apologize for that. There's there's one or two other questions in the chat that maybe if everybody could, our panelists take a look at. I know one of them speaks specifically to and maybe Phil, um, when you said you think almost half of visits are going to become telehealth, sort of maybe giving a little background in there. Um, well, and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to run afoul of our hosts. I know they're probably on a strict timeline. So Arundhati, are you, uh, are you ready to close us out or? I'm, I'm happy to have you guys uh, take uh, the last few questions if uh, all okay. of you have the time. Yeah, yeah, so we, yeah, go ahead, Phil. Yeah. So when you start with that, I would say, you know, where that 50% number comes from, that's a number that Kaiser puts out there today. So I think people look at them as the bellwether. Now, you know, they're a closed system, they're fully capitated, et cetera, et cetera, but they're doing it today. When I talk to other advanced groups, particularly on the West Coast who are, um, you know, who may have large, uh, you know, large value-based portfolios, they believe that they're gonna get there as well. So that's, that's where that number's coming from. And then I believe we had another question, um, which is a good one is, how are we? How are the organizations that are really heavily investing in technology um, and digital advances? How are they? How are you monitoring the actual impact? How do you know if telehealth is a success or if switching to a particular kind of um, technology is actually producing the outcomes that you hope and want? Well, we know telehealth is a success just simply by adoption. So you know, patients voting with their feet, right? So. Uh, again, I think I mentioned that one, or maybe this was on another call, one physician mentioned that on Sunday, um, 35 of the 40 persons that he saw in a practice in uh, Verona, New Jersey and Bergen County were tele, whereas two weeks ago it would have been 35 in person and five. So, so that's, that's a measure of the impact or success. With other technologies, it's, it's a bit harder in terms of the health information exchange. A lot of that is based on feedback from our clinical partners. Do they see it as valuable or not? Are they using it or not? So we, we measure and monitor utilization. Uh, in this case, utilization is a positive thing, not a negative thing. Usually health plans talk about utilization as being utilization review and control and reduction. So, so that's how we look at the health information exchange and the use of uh, health cloud. And then ultimately it comes down to TME, 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 total medical expense, total me medical yeah. expense and key quality measures as represented by Medicare star and HEDIS. Yeah, I would say we have good evidence in our digital programs for the outcomes, um, right? We know that, um, but totally, um, you know, totally, totally agree that, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to look back at this and say, so what did happen to quality? What did happen to total medical cost? And, uh, and we'll be adapting, these programs will adapt, right? I don't think the final chapter has been written in telehealth. Um, these programs will adapt uh, to make sure that we do ensure those things. And a related question just popped up, um, you know, that do, do you all feel that payers will continue to support the value proposition of telehealth, even as we are able to go back and, and see our doctors as we, usually, as we usually do? So do you feel pretty confident that the continued regulatory and financial support are there? Yeah, we're continuing to pay telehealth at parity. Um, uh, a couple of the large nationals said they're going to reintroduce uh, co copays. Um, I think it's likely we'll do that, although we haven't done that yet. Yeah, I would say I think it continues, um, but but I think we'll be collecting data along the way, um, you know, to demonstrate outcomes. 
Well, I'm being uh, given the big hook by our host, and I certainly want to be a good steward, but I'm very excited that um, we had such a robust discussion. Thank you to everybody that, that tuned in. Thank you especially to our panelists, Scott, Taylor, Stephen, and Phil. Um, best of luck. Keep us posted as you continue to navigate the, the strange new world that we're all living in, and hopefully is a better world than we came from. And many, well, many great thanks. Great job moderating. Oh, thank you. Uh, happy to be here with all you guys. Um, many thanks to Med City and to NOLA BA. And I am sure our, our next uh, session is going to be equally as exciting. Thank you so much, Dr. Avigno and the panel. I really appreciated all your remarks. Um, really interesting, uh, you know, sort of a pivotal moment that we are in, in terms of healthcare transformation. Um, I will quickly share my screen to show you what we have coming up. Um, tomorrow. So tomorrow we have our startup uh, pitch contest. We have six intrepid uh, startups and three equally strict uh, judges uh, that will be reviewing them. And then we'll have a networking session right after the pitch contest where we will announce the winner um, of the contest. Uh, we also wanted to alert you to the NOLA High Showcase. So this is um, for our partners at New Orleans Business Alliance, they hold a, a summit called uh, New Orleans Health, Innovator, Health Innovators Challenge. And so startups from that uh, will be showcased at our uh, networking event uh, tomorrow. And then the conversation will continue with NOLA High with these uh, panels on Thursday and on Friday. And so we urge all of you to attend at that um, discussion and see those startups as well. Uh, again, you are more than welcome uh, to go and register. The information will be also placed in the chat. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending uh, our second day of Pop Health and to again, to all the panelists who shared their very different but sort of unified perspectives on what needs to be done to redefine population health. Thank you all and hopefully see you soon.